Now let's look at Smith's famous digression on corn, which shows perhaps his deepest understanding of the price system. The formal title of this section is Digression Concerning the Corn Trade and Corn Laws, and keep in mind this is the end part of Chapter 5 in Book 4. And as English was used in Great Britain at that time, the word corn was referring to wheat and other grains. For purposes of historical background, keep in mind that England had had corn laws, as they were called, since medieval times. These laws consisted of a variety of restrictions on the export and import of corn, and also a variety of taxes. These laws were very much in flux during the 18th century, but basically Smith was arguing for free trade in corn. To read more on the corn laws, you can Google to a good short piece written by Ellen Polino. It's online. Keep in mind here, if you consult Wikipedia, at least as of early 2013, they treat the corn laws as pertaining only to the 19th century, and that's really not quite an accurate picture. When it comes to the Corn Laws, Smith once again is arguing for the virtues of the market price system, and he is using modes of reasoning which resemble his well-known arguments about the invisible hand. Here is one typical passage, and I quote, Without intending the interest of the people, he, the merchant, is necessarily led by a regard to his own interest to treat them, the people, even in years of scarcity, pretty much in the same manner as the prudent master of a vessel is sometimes obliged to treat his crew. What Smith is saying here is that the incentives given by market prices give merchants an incentive to produce goods and services which will make consumers better off, and this is including people who eat food. In times of greater scarcity, there is an incentive to try to bring more food to the market. But Smith just doesn't make a general case for the price system. He considers some specific reasons and arguments for why market prices might misfire, and he tries to answer them. For instance, one common criticism of the market price system is that perhaps speculators and monopolists will burn crops to limit their supply, therefore driving up the price. To put this argument in the form of a modern graph, imagine here we have a demand curve, here's price, Here's quantity. The demand curve slopes down. If you imagine the stock of the good is already produced, well, consumers might just wait out the supplier until the price falls, and they can buy a lot of the corn at a relatively cheap price. But if the supplier comes along and burns some of the corn, let's say cuts off quantity here, burning this amount of corn, then the maximum quantity that can enter the market is this amount, and it could be the new price is then here, we have this price times this quantity, and perhaps a higher amount of profit resulting from the restriction of output. Smith, however, stresses that that is extremely unlikely. In this market, there is a lot of competition, and he believes that suppliers of corn find it very difficult to combine and produce some coordinated result to raise the entire market price, because there are many of them, they are scattered and dispersed, and they must compete with each other. Rather than viewing merchants as manipulating prices, Smith instead views them as seeking prices which are suitable to the scarcity or plentity of the season. And there's a kind of price experimentation which goes on, with feedback depending on how much a merchant is able to sell at a given price, and what kind of prices people expect for the future. If people expect much higher prices in the future, you will then have some suppliers withholding corn from the market. Imagine, for instance, that everyone is realizing that all of a sudden there's a poor harvest coming. This is a withholding of corn from the market, and often it is resented, because people see corn not being sold. But what in fact is happening is the speculators are realizing that the future price will be higher, the demand for corn will be more pressing in this future, and thus overall they're doing the world good by reallocating production toward times of higher demand. And on this point, Smith has an excellent passage, and I quote, the popular fear of engrossing and forestalling, speculating, may be compared to the popular terrors and suspicions of witchcraft. Smith also considers putting price controls on corn, and he has a pretty clear argument that this leads to a shortage that not enough corn will be brought to market. In terms of a modern picture, we can draw it this way. Here's supply and demand, there's price, there's quantity, 
There's our demand curve, there's our upward sloping supply curve, and a price control is, say, setting the price down here below market clearing, and what we find happening at that price is demand is quite high, given here, supply is relatively low, given here, and this amount is the degree of shortage. And this is bad for both producers in con and consumers in typical market settings. In this digression, Smith also offers an extended defense of middlemen. Middlemen bring together buyers and sellers and help enable trades. Middlemen help allocate resources, in this case corn, toward places and times where the demand for those resources will be highest. And Smith is really regarding middlemen as part of this invisible hand process through which market prices allocate resources efficiently. Smith also asks, well, what about export restrictions on corn? Export restrictions, in essence, tell domestic farmers that they cannot send their corn abroad. These restrictions are sometimes popular because people think, well, if we're hungry, why is it we're sending corn abroad? But Smith is skeptical about export restrictions. He again realizes that the freer market is more likely to produce a higher supply of foodstuffs. He argues that in a world of export restrictions, farmers are much less likely to produce a lot in the first place. And here's a very typical quotation of how Smith's argument runs, and I quote, this is the case of export restrictions, quote, that market will very seldom be overstocked, but it will generally be understocked. In other words, Smith thought these export restrictions would be self-defeating. This section, the digression on the corn trade and the corn laws, it's arguably Smith's most sophisticated defense of the market price mechanism. It's incorrect to think of Smith as always favoring markets in every case. He did make room for actually a fair number of exceptions. But when it came to foodstuffs, he really did generally believe in market solutions. This is one of the most compelling parts of the wealth of nations, in my view. And when I first read this book, I think I was 15 years old, it was actually my favorite part of the entire Wealth of Nations. So I recommend it to all readers.